A ko tu whera um, i tēnei hui, e tū mō te karaki e. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tāi. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Morena Koto, and welcome everyone to today's Strategy and Policy Committee meeting. Uh, please let me or Cyrus, our Democracy Advisor, know if you intend to leave the meeting during the morning, councillors. Uh, morning tea will be at 10.30. Please remember to put your electronic devices on silent. I feel like we could have this pre-recorded almost, couldn't we? Um, we could get Swampy to do it. Yes. <laughs> um, I should also note um, that the meeting is being live-streamed. Um, and I just wanted to um, make a, a wee um, mention today um, that you know we're approaching the um, first year anniversary of um, the March um, 15th terrorist attack. Um, and so just to acknowledge um, the, the tough journey that people have been on in many communities, and particularly uh, our um, whānau down in Christchurch who um, have, have, have had to live with the effects of this for a whole year now. Um, and for many people it's still um, very fresh and challenging. Uh, and just wanted to um, remind councillors and the public that um, on uh, Sunday there's um, the Yuma Day at Shed 6 um, from 10 till 4, um, which is an opportunity for the community to come together and reflect um, on this, um, on the events of um, 15th of March last year. Um, there's an exhibition and there'll be speakers, so highly worth um, councillors popping along and the public popping along and just showing our continued support for our, um, our Muslim whānau. I just also need to note that item 2.2, the Wellington Convention and Exhibition Centre naming has been withdrawn to allow further discussion with mana whenua and other interested parties um, and the topic will be brought back um, for consideration at a later date. Um, now I just call for apologies. Um, I have an apology from Mayor Foster and then an apology for lateness from Councillor Nicola Young. Are there any other apologies? No. Um, do I um, have a seconder? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Free. Do we have to vote by hand, do we? We need to vote by hand for this one. So I now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Right, that's unanimously carried. Uh, I call on members to declare any conflicts of interest that they may have in relation to the items on the agenda. Are there any conflicts of interest today? No. Um, confirmation of minutes. I move the motion that the Strategy and Policy Committee approve the minutes of the Strategy and Policy Committee meeting held on the 5th of March 2020, having been circulated, and that they be taken as read and confirmed as an accurate record of that meeting. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Fitzsimons. I now put the motion, which has been moved and seconded. Are we going to have to do it by hand again? Those in favour, please raise your hand. Okay, that's unanimously carried. Um, there are no items not on the agenda this morning, um, and we do have some public participation. We have um, four different um, participants this morning, and we will begin um, with Guy Ryan, No My Guy. If you'd like to come up to the table just down here, um, Guy is here um, representing Inspiring Stories. Um, he's going to be talking to us about Festival for the Future, which is being a very exciting celebration this year. Thanks, Guy, for coming in. And so you've got 10 minutes, but you might want to leave a little bit of time for questions in that 10 minutes. Can people hear? Oh, powerful. Tēnā um, koutou katoa, nā mihi nui kia koutou. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to come in. Um, I've got about seven minutes, so I'll be reasonably quick. Um, has anyone heard of Festival for the Future before? A couple of people, maybe half the councillors. Okay, great. I'll give you, for those who haven't heard, I'll give you a very brief background. Uh, Festival for the Future, uh, now annual event, very much looking at leadership and innovation for the big issues of our time. It's an annual event here in Wellington. Started out 10 years ago as a 100-person event at the Film Archive. Um, took it to Te Papa, it grew. We took it to Auckland for five years. We brought it back to Wellington two years ago. Now, Festival attracts uh, 1,200 delegates each year. So we run at TSB Arena, Shed 6, Fariwaka, our delegates come from every region nationwide. Uh, last year we had delegates from 12, uh, 12 different countries. The US, Australia, Myanmar, Indonesia, Pacific Islands. More and more it's becoming international. 
Uh, our delegates range from um, mayors and councillors uh, to government ministers, senior government officials, um, directors and senior business leaders, uh, young people from right across Aotearoa, New Zealand and the Asia Pacific. So um, it's very much transitioned from a, a, just a youth event uh, and, and attracting mostly young people to now increasingly intergenerational um, and attracts uh, an audience that's very much interested in making a difference for our future. So uh, the, the kind of major themes we change up every year, there's a whole range of speakers, workshops, different satellite events, um, range from uh, climate change, how do we have emissions by 2050, um, sorry, how do, we, how do we get to carbon zero by 2050, through to looking at big business for impact, through to looking at levers um, around policy change, how do we create a more inclusive society, how do we build more inclusive economies, um, we, we change up the themes every year. This is our 10th annual festival this year, um, which is really exciting for us. Um, and just want to acknowledge the support that Council have given us, particularly over the last two years, which has enabled us to bring it back to Wellington, consolidate and continue to grow it in Wellington. As I understand, the festival is one of, if not the biggest, annual conference in the city already. Where we want to grow festival, um, if you imagine what WOW is for creative arts and fashion sector, that's where we want to take festival for leadership and innovation um, for the big issues of our time um, and build its significance for the Asia Pacific region. So this year, um, subject to what plays out with coronavirus, um, we've, we've already got a number of um, delegations co committed to coming from overseas. Um, we've got the United Nations UNDP program who's partnering with us to bring young leaders from the Asia Pacific um, and host a dialogue in New Zealand looking at how we better um, mobilise and support the next generation to deliver on global goals over the next 10 years. Um, we've got the Minister of Finance hosting uh, an event at Parliament um, earlier in the week looking at 10 years of impact. There's a whole range of amazing different partnerships and initiatives that are building out. Um, last year we launched the Impact Awards, um, which ran on the Saturday night of festival, where we gave out 20,000 in prizes to young people doing great stuff for our country. Um, and our Impact Awards were enterprise, inclusion, climate and wellbeing. That gives you a sense of some of the major festival themes. Um, and the award ceremony uh, sold out. It attracted 400 attendees, including senior leaders from business and government, as well as young people from across the nation. So um, in the interest of time, I wanted to get Festival on your radar. Um, would love to extend an invitation um, for you to, to come along and check it out. Last year, um, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor helped to host a number of youth councils from across the country around the festival. Um, we'd love to continue that this year, if we can. Um, and increasingly, you know, we've got a lot of New Zealand's top tier businesses and government agencies who are all sending um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 grads, young professionals. Um, that's enough for now. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Paul. Morena. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I was lucky enough to host one of the masterclasses last year, but I guess mm. what prevented me from going to the whole festival was the ticket price. So I just wanted to know um, or just understand more how most young people get there, like what kind mm. of sponsorship um, avenues there are yeah. and um, how we can kind of look at reducing that cost, especially for people from, I guess, the regions. Great question. Yeah. Great question. Um, so when we started the festival 10 years ago, we were selling tickets to young people for very cheap and the festival ran at a massive loss. Slowly but surely we've had to push prices up and it's very much now businesses and organisations tend to bulk buy tickets on behalf of young people that they work with. So a lot of councils would support, say, the youth councils to attend. Um, various universities, schools would support young people from their respective communities. Um, again, a lot of top tier businesses and government would, would bulk buy 10 to 20, 30, 40, 50 tickets, um, as well as ticket pricing, uh, and we have kind of super early bird right through to regular rate, students, professionals. Um, we do run quite a significant scholarships program. So last year we supported about 300 young people through scholarship support, um, which ranged from young people uh, from New some of New Zealand's lowest socioeconomic rural communities where we covered ticket, transport and accommodation, who are part of our Future Leaders program that we run, 
Um, we also supported a number of young people from the Muslim community in Christchurch to come up to participate and contribute. Um, there's always more that we can do to reduce the barriers um, and increase scholarship support for young people um, and welcome further conversation in that space. Um, it might be worth also um, talking about the awards and how you structured that because it was quite a different model, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, so the Impact Awards, which happened for the first time last year, so built the brand, built the website, built the name on a marketing budget of like 100 bucks. We had 200 applicants from right across the country, 12 regions, and um, we made up a model for the awards ceremony that would sell tables for $2,500 each, um, and the organisations like, you know, big business, big government, philanthropic sector would buy those, but they'd only get half the seats at the table, half the seats we gifted out through scholarship support um, to young future leaders from across the nation. And it was amazing. We had seasoned awards attendees who said it was the best awards they've ever been to. So it was an amazing prototype. And, and legally we're a charity and everything that we do really operates like a social enterprise. So if we make surplus on something, we reinvest it back into scholarship support or pathways for, for young people. Councillor Foon. Kia ora Guy, great to have you in here and, and share the mahi of inspiring stories and festival for the future. As an organisation, what, what are the three biggest challenges tightly that you, you face? We great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, we've come an incredibly long way over the last ten years. Big ups and downs. Right now, we're in the best place we've ever been. Um, we've got a team of about twenty of us, half in Wellington, half on the ground in rural provincial communities. Um, I mean, our biggest challenge is always kind of funding and resourcing to enable us to scale up the things that we want to do to increase access. Um, and to increase impact. So if we think about that bigger vision of what WOW is to the city and where we could take festival for the future over the next 10 years, that's a big piece of um, investment partnership support that right now we don't have the, 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 the means, the, the, you know, the resourcing to make that happen. That's a big partnership opportunity for both central, local government and private sector. Um, and I, kind of, I guess in relation to that, it's a lot of the kind of international connectivity and partnerships that enable us to take it from here to here over the next 10 years. Um, thirdly, we would like a, uh, a longer standing commitment and partnership with Council. Um, right now, this is the final year of a two year initial agreement with Council. Uh, council, through the City Growth Fund, Council put um, 100k over two years, so 50k a year each year, 2018-2019. Yep. Thank you, Guy. That's all the questions for today, and thank you so much. It was very um, helpful for councillors to be able to hear where things are up to for inspiring stories. Thank so, you. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Amahi. Uh, uh, kia ora, um, Stephen Moore, um, if you'd like to come forward. Um, Stephen's going to talk to us a little bit this morning just about um, some thoughts he's had about the transport system. So Stephen, you've got um, five minutes. He's got some handouts, I think, I understand. Oh, they're just up there. They've, they've got them over there. They'll hand them round to us. You don't need to worry about that now. Um, so you have five minutes, Stephen, and if you do want to allow any time for questions, it needs to be within that five minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, it's got it slightly wrong on my, um, okay, 10 minutes, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Yes. Uh, here we go. Firstly, thank you for the opportunity to present to this group. My name is Stephen Moore, and I'm one of the members of a group called Faster or Fast Aerial Safe Transport by Rail for Wellington. Our concern is that those people that have been looking at mass transport options for Wellington have not appeared to consider this option. 
Um, one of the big options we're looking at is this suspended light rail. It's a variation of monorail, but with significant differences. If you want to look at the screen, here's a... When it works. Fine, it was working two seconds ago. Obviously, something will come to it at the end. Basically, it's a system where the trains are running on columns above their road. It's a variation of monorail, it's slightly different because it's a French invention where it runs on electric, running on rubber wheels. It's been operating in Totoko for the last 50 years. It's got a very similar capacity to light rail 228 seats of people sitting in a three car train, or 496 of people are standing. The track doesn't move, it's not like a minor rail where it needs to change the direction of the track, it has normal damn switching points. I'll just swap it across to my other down partner now. Good morning. Do I have to keep it pushed? No. <laughs> I'm a specialist in occupational medicine for the last 35 years, uh, in particular concerned with transport safety and the medical aspects of that. Uh, you will have heard from Stephen how um, light rail and suspended light rail differ, and it, particularly in terms of the elevation of the um, cabs with suspended light rail, which is an important safety feature. I'm going to focus on that now. I suggest when you look at the handouts that you save the text for later rather than following it slavishly, but you might like to turn to the second to last page, which has a tentative map of the sort of route we're looking at. So, in terms of safety, uh, suspended light rail is separated from the ground level traffic, so it completely eliminates the risk of pedestrians wandering across the path of the vehicle. Uh, I know we're going a bit too fast here. It doesn't cause ground-based emergencies from collisions with vehicles. Let's get the buttons fixed here. It's independent of safety hotspots such as traffic lights, intersection, and emergency call-outs for fire service or uh, ambulance vehicles. There's no need for it to slow down during ground-based congestion at peak times or for any other reason, such as festivals that are going on around the city. Where the track changes direction, that creates no hazard to ground-based transport. And the bottom line of all these safety features is that suspended light rail can reliably go faster than other forms of transport. It can go at up to 70 kilometres per hour, so that over the track between the Wellington station and the airport, allowing for 12 stops, it can cover that in less than 20 minutes. It's not limited by road speed limits. It's not affected by road emergencies, or by ground-based traffic lights or intersections, or by road congestion at peak or other times. And as we've said, it can swing from curbside to road centre, even to off-road, with no safety impact in terms of traffic below it. So it doesn't have to slow down unnecessarily at times like that. Those are the advantages once the system is established. But what about the construction? It's quicker and easier to construct than uh, ordinary light rail. It doesn't require any tunnels at all, and what we've seen so far for the light rail plans is three tunnels which haven't been particularly highlighted but are a major impact in terms of cost and congestion during construction. There's less on-site construction because the pylon footings are spaced 35 metres apart. They're the only part that has to be constructed on-site. The rest is done off-site and brought in at appropriate times. Again, because the footings are spaced widely apart, that minimises the need for digging and repositioning of underground services so that they can be accessed later on for maintenance. And that's a significant cost of light rail. So all of these things mean that SLR construction has less impact on local businesses and on residents. It's swifter construction in a single stage, taking less than three years, means that the significant benefits of, of speed and safety are achieved very much sooner and much more comprehensively than with light rail. And in terms of economy, it's economically competitive because of all, the, all of these uh, advantages that we've mentioned. 
OK, I'll hand back to Stephen at this stage. It enhances boarding access because it's above the road. It's got mobility access so you can have lifts up to the platforms as we've seen in J Japan. Overhead stations can give safety and shelter and ticketing before boarding so you don't have a delay of people getting on board and then trying to see if they already swiped their tickets or not. The Golden Mile stations could be combined with retailers so hence the train could come into a first floor the building, people could go inside, use the lifts, then come out and board the train at that other level or could have standalone stations. For the regional hospital, instead of having to have a flight rail people down on the street, they having to walk up the steps, the train itself could enter the hospital the same as they do in Japan. At the main railway station, instead of being out on the side, it can come in and come around to the back of the concourse where people walk through to the um, Westpac Down Stadium. It can use almost any route, so it doesn't have to have a road underneath it. You could run this down the Golden Mile very easily. It, we don't need to disrupt the Basin Reserve. It can run around on ponds and around the side in front of the um, groom if you wanted to. But our proposed route is by coming up Taranaki Street and Wells Street and through John Street down. You're actually providing a better service for the people on the route through the University and the Polytech. Newtown Regional Hospital, I've covered that. We're suggesting there could be a station at High Tide Time quite easily at the bottom of Wellington Road. And when you've got the current investment in the Kilburnie Bus Hub, this could be built above the Kilburnie Bus Hub so you could have bicycle parking underneath and the buses coming in and people going up to get onto the main fast transport. It also has the ability too to come and upgrade and provide a flat level walk in for the Evans Bay Sports Down Stadium. So let's keep my eye on the time. We believe it can use the Miramar cutting quite easily and quickly. You have an overhead station at Miramar Avenue. Too late to edit. Well, it's also got the ability too, if you ran this up for where the current train level goes towards Johnsonville, you could very easily continue it through into either um, Newlands or Chewton Park, which light rail cannot do very easily. This was a quick map of the route, so I'm just looking at the time. It's environmentally friendly. Very quiet beyond rubber wheels, it's only 65 decibels, which is talking speed at 15, 1.5 metres away. It's electric, or there's some of the Chinese versions running on the batteries. It does have a visual impact, which we can talk about afterwards, but I think this will become quite iconic, and it is up quite high. We believe that the city would embrace this as a symbol of the city's commitment to mass transport. So just to sum up, while conventional light rail works well in cities with big, wide, open streets, it's very difficult for them to put into very hilly terrain. This is ideally them suited for that. It provides absolute safety for pedestrians and for cyclists. No one's going to get their cycle wheels put into a tram track, whereas conventional light rail can only achieve this by going underground or being elevated. Hopefully this part will work. So. While well, Stephen's setting that up, we're, we're open to questions. Councillor Sparrow. Um, what's the same connected device? I've got it. I don't think it's going to play on that system. I found that problem with the monitor. Ah, uh, so obviously it's a... I don't know if you see, you want to have a look. I can give you a link. I'm just going to move forward to 6 minutes 38. And but meanwhile, any Councillor Perry, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay, thank you very much for that. My initial impression is, um, yeah, it looks pretty good. But one question I have is in terms of stations, um, time and ease of access, can that, could that be a, a problem? To me, that's an actual advantage of the M system. Ease of access is very simple. If you're talking about access through buildings along the Golden Mile, we're using existing either escalators or lifts. You're talking about blocking off a lot of the side streets onto the Golden Mile and that's the perfect space then to have a platform or station because you've got four columns the platform is above the road or the intersection and then you'd have either a lift for people that have got mobility issues or you could have escalators or steps what we've seen in the Japanese examples is where they have bicycle parking underneath the station so that people can ride their bikes to do this very fast metre transport and park and then Way from there. So to me it's one of the advantages, not the disadvantage. And ticketing will be sorted before people board it, they can board swiftly. 
So that speeds up the on. Um, I've got a question. I'm going to allow one more question. Um, Councillor Connie was next on the list just because we've had to spend a bit of time sorting out IT. So I'll just allow Councillor Connie and then we'll finish there. I was just wondering, um, we've, there's a couple of examples you've mentioned, Japan, and there's one in here about Germany. Where, how many places in the world is this currently operational? If, if, as far as I can tell, it's been operational in Japan for 50 years. They expanded it in 1998. They're doing examples in Germany since 1901. They've got new ones at the Dortmund University that they've been looking at. There's also the Chinese are developing it for China and for Wuhan, where they've got examples of, they call it the Sky Panda and the Sky Train. But it seems to be under development there's they're looking to go into it. This is basically, it's a new system, or newish, because right rather than around at ground level, this is one coming in for people where you're trying to retrofit into a very tight streets, with very hilly streets. And the fact that this can go up grades and down grades, it's an advantage, and that's why there isn't as many in around the world. Because most overseas the cities that are big for mass transit are very big with wide streets and alternative routes. There are links at the end of the handout if you want to look at video of these things. Okay. Oh. As I said, our aim is only to have this considered. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come in. Um, and <laughs> All right. Our next, our next public participant is uh, Mary Hobbs. Mary, if you'd like to come forward. Um, and Mary's going to talk to us about the social housing policy. Mary, has, um, you have five minutes. If you want to allow a little bit of time for questions, I'm sure there could be some questions for you. Thank you for coming in this morning. So, the thing that worries me most about the, um, the, the plan changes is the comment that was attributed to some of the council officers that said they couldn't see how superannuitants could possibly have as many needs as people on job seeker benefit. Um, I have enormous needs trying to trying to manage a basic living arrangement on my food food and um, chemical chemical um, are well over a hundred a week, which is more than most people would. Um, I need a lot of total mobility taxis because of my atrial fibrillation heart problem. It's a wonderful system, and I hope they keep them. But they do mount up, even at half price, so I can't afford anywhere near as many as I need. And when I go to the doctor, I can't afford to get a taxi both ways out to, out to Newtown, so I end up getting off the bus and having to walk quite a steep slope, and I'm usually quite ill. The, the heart starts to flutter by the time I get up there. So if I get any more rent money taken off me, I'm liable to be in an even more precarious position. Um, another problem with the... Um, with the overall income, I don't have much decent clothing, and I'm at some of the mercy of some of the um, city housing people who told me that I was so poorly presented that I had to be um, reported to the welfare officer. If this horrible arrangement goes ahead, I do know something has to be done, but I don't think this is the best way to do it. Is it possible to have an appeal procedure in for the uh, for the amount of rent that's actually been um, charged from somebody? They might be able to get a reconsideration of individual circumstances. And let me see. I, I'm having some difficulty reading through my notes. I put them together in a hurry. Ah. And the, I wish to speak briefly to the council welfare policy. The system called the welfare visit is actually illegal. The, the Residential Tenancy Act doesn't allow landlords to, um, to, to ask for forced entry to people's property other than for, um, for monthly inspection of property, but you can't go in and ask to inspect people. And there's no clear policy over what the welfare visits are actually used for. 
I had one attempted on me a while ago, and when I asked what was it for, they said, oh, it was entirely optional. We want to show you all the, all the wonderful things we have to offer you. But if you don't want to, it's optional. But a lot of people have actually had it forced on them, and some people have even had 90-day notices. Um, if you don't let us in, we'll give you a 90-day notice. So this welfare visit needs to be really needs to be looked at and, for a start, made legal. We've got a couple of questions. I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Mary. We've got a couple of questions. Um, so, Councillor Fitzsimons. Thanks, Mary, and it's good to see you again after law school, and I can see that some of those issues are still coming through. I just want to say um, that, as I said to you before, this is a genuine consultation that's open-minded. But I also wanted to ask you about um, what conversations you've had with the local MP, Grant Robertson, about the income-related rent subsidy, and ask you whether you might be able to have some more conversations with him because I know that you are quite close to Grant. I had one such conversation quite some time ago at a meeting where Brian Dawson was attending and I said to Brian Dawson, is the government going to give you any more money? And he turned around and said, Grant, you're going to give us any more money? And Grant looked sort of um, slightly taken aback and said, we'll have to see. I suspect if the question was asked again, the result might be um, very much the same, but we can see what, sh what can be done. Thank you. Councillor Calvert. Um, thank you for coming in, Mary. Um, in terms of, um, there was some um, pre-engagement by our officers with some, um, to, uh, before they presented this to us. Have you had any indication of what it will mean to you? Do you believe that your rent will be going up? Yes. So have they, have they let you know that that could well be the case? Um, no, I haven't had actual engagement with the officers. I've just had... Um, I've actually seen media contact. I've had no actual engagement with the officers. Would you mind if we ask the officers to make get in contact with you to look at your personal circumstances and what the impact might be for you? Yes, you could do that. Would that be all right? That would be fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've taken all my time and just... You did perfectly, Mary. Thank you very much for coming in. It's very important that you could share with us, with us so thank you. Uh, our next public participant is Bridget Baker, um, and she's coming to talk to us as well about social the social housing policy. And Bridget, you've got five minutes, um, so same, if you want to leave a bit of time within there for questions, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, I have um, looked at this very rapidly, um, and I have sent out um, something something written and I have a couple of additions to make to that. But my basic concern is when I look at um, the affordability of this and what was um, listed as how we test for affordability and people not paying more than 35% of their rents was something that was listed as affordability. A couple of years ago, um, City Council's review showed that two-thirds of City Council tenants were paying more than two-thirds of their income in rent. Um, and then we're, now we're looking at a, another affordability model, which I, I can see you've you know, got KPMG and the, the, the rest onto it, but I really, really want to know how well this is tested on the ground, and I think that needs to be a very thorough part of the consultation process. Um, I see there's a sample given. The sample, at one point, I think it says 80%, but it doesn't say it's random. Um, what are the... Who, who has been... Um, looked at and who has not been looked at um, and from my understanding of the way this cons consultation has happened with tenants that, and my observation of other consultations over time, any pre-engagement is very vague um, and I would suggest that in the consultation process there's, there's something more thorough happens. Now I might be wrong um, but I do really struggle with how do we go from um, so, something that's for um, low-income people, and it looks like it's um, it's shifting to higher-income people. Um, we have a we have a list of very low, very low, low and median, um, moderate-income people listed in this. We have a, um, and it looks to me that um, this will shift. Um, who gets to stay in council housing 
and who gets taken into council housing. Um, so I have um, some recommendations. My recommendation is that the summary page, um, I had additional recommendations, sorry, to what I've put. I have a recommendation that the summary page of... Um, uh, there, there's a summary of implications of this policy change. Um, should... Um, state clearly or show clearly, and the whole policy should show document, consultation document should show clearly that um, there is a potential shift to a higher bracket of income involved here um, and that the public should be clearly able to see that um, and that tenants should clearly be able to see that. Um, and that consultation, um, so this is a second addition, suggestion addition to the, my recommendations, is that consultation should include the modelling of this affordability applied to each tenant. If you've gone out and applied it on paper to 80% or to 1,400 tenants, it should be applied for each tenant. And I would suggest that if you're going to bring services to the door, that should model that now too. And if you're modelling the change for individuals, that there should be social work or budgeting people involved in that process, and those people should be able to report back into the consultation process and it be a transparent process. I really want to call City Council to stand to um, acknowledging that we are in a housing crisis, but we stand committed to the most vulnerable that we already support, and we don't shift it down. Uh, we don't allow the need to trickle, trickle down to these people, and that we um, keep calling to government to... Uh, um, to so effectively, we need to cap what is... Um, charge to people that we we care for in our city and we need to keep calling to government to say how do we cap the, the bigger picture because we do have a bigger picture and it is beyond our control and we're not fixing it by nice words that look good but are not. And I do appreciate this might be a push towards pushing um, council uh, government to give us IRS. Um, but I don't think this is the way to do it, and I think we will end up with more poverty and homelessness as a result. Thank you. Um, Councillor Calvert, you've got a question. Yes. Um, yeah, I was re really interested in your last recommendation, number six, and you just made a comment about um, IRRS. Um, so I think it's... Um, I mean, what do you think our council should be doing more in that space um, rather than relying on tenants to call out to Grant Robinson across the room? I, I think we need to label it up front pu publicly. I have been to so many consultations where council have said before that money was not the problem, and then money is the problem. Mm. Um, we, name it as it is, and let us, with all our public conscience, address it. Don't, um, and, and then we perhaps will get um, more more calling to our government to do it and we will get more traction on something like capital gains tax and all the other housing regulation stuff mm. that is not happening. So, so would you support us formally, you know, making contact with the government in, in requesting a, a consideration of income-related rents to our eligible tenants? Um, or do you think there's another yes, way of doing it? For, formally, as a yeah. council, but yes, allowing it to come out openly and frankly to the public so that we call the public you to... To it. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for taking the time to come in to talk to us this morning. Thank you. All right, so councillors, in accordance with Standing Order 3.9.2, I'd like to rearrange the agenda items in the following order. We'll begin with item 2.4, the um, Wellington City Council Standing Orders Review. Item 2.1, update on the Wellington City Council Housing Strategy and Housing Action. And item 2.3, social housing policy. So we will now begin with item 2.4. Uh, Councillor, oh sorry, Deputy Mayor Free, if you'd like to. The changes are being tabled as well. Uh, I'd like to refer to that in your okay. introduction. <laughs> so um, are we talking about the um, more, most recent proposals, the most recent amendments from Councillor Panett, or the, the changes as well? Okay, okay, okay. 
So um, I would like to introduce this paper by just saying this has been a work in progress for quite some time. And I'd really like to thank Cyrus, but not only Cyrus, we have past staff members and past councillors who've actually put their heads on trying to do a, um, an update of our standing orders. Um, and this has probably been work that's taken place over the last three years, in fact, but um, Cyrus has picked it up and run with it over the last few months, and I think he's done a very, very impressive job. So, you know, our standing orders were quite cumbersome, and um, I've looked through them many times, but I've not always found them particularly easy to read as a whole. So um, I've tended to just go to them when I've wanted to know something specific. I've never found them easy to read as a complete document, and I think that's for me, has been the biggest change as I sat down and actually read them from cover to cover and I found it relatively easy to understand. So a big part of what Cyrus has done with the help of a working group of seven councillors um, that have met a couple of times and also several face-to-face -face meetings with individual councillors, several emails, um, we've had a group meeting as well to discuss it, workshop. Um, there's been quite a lot of input but I think for me one of the biggest changes has just been the legibility of it, putting things that, go, that naturally sit together in the same place, making the font a little bit more readable um, adapting the language and in some cases just putting in some extra things as a result of what's standard with the local government um, standard um, documents. We have chosen to retain a few things in this draft um, in the suggestion that are peculiar to Wellington City Council um, so at present we still have the pro forma that we've always had and some of the other um, you know, unique things to Wellington remain. Um, I see that on the table there are some amendments still to come. We've had lots, but there's still some to come. Look, but I'm just moving it basically as it is. None of the recommendations, um, I'm not moving it pro forma, I'm moving it as it is. And I guess I'm asking for a seconder. Sorry, so you're not moving those ones? Uh, the, the, yeah, the ones that are on the table that are not yours, Councillor Panner, have come actually with officer support. Um, so they will be put into the document in front of us as, dra as, as red track changes, but they are officer advice. Yep. 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 So as and then also on, yeah, as a result of councillor feedback and discussion from the workshop we had the other day, but also on the table are some later amendments from councillor Pannett, or some additional amendments from councillor Pannett that weren't so generally accepted at the workshop and are not haven't come with officer advice, so they're open to be debated. Um, I hope that's introduced this adequately. Um, do I have a seconder? Yes. Right. Thank you, Councillor Day. Uh, well, I'm happy to second this, and I'm pleased that it's finally here. Uh, we tried last triennium to get this going, and then it got to the point where um, we really needed to wait till this triennium because it needed to be adopted by the new council. Um, I would like to acknowledge the work that Cyrus has done while people were having a lovely time on beaches in January. He was busy poring over the standing orders and the, um, the sample standing or the, um, the sort of standard, the model standing orders, um, and, and working out how he could make it as user friendly as possible. Because um, there are parts of it that obviously sit in legislation and have to be there, and then there are parts that make it work for us. And working out um, what's important for this council um, has taken some time. So thank you for that, and thank you for. Um, including councillors in the process as well. Um, these are really the tools of our trade and they make it easier for us to make good decisions. Sorry, I just had a question put in front of me. Um, and so I think it's really important that we do understand these and that we make sure that they work really well for us. And so having the model ones, um, having the model standing orders very distracting. Having the model standing orders is very helpful because it, it shows us where the baseline can be but it is also about building what works for our city and we do have some unique um, things that we have used in the past and we find work for us. So I think it was good to be able to go through that process. Um, I know there are some changes coming and I'll support some of those changes. Um, I just also need to say, um, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Free reminded me that we need 75% um, majority to pass these standing orders. So just so that councillors are aware to be able to do it, we need 75% um, support. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's really important that we have something to work by. We have the legislation, but these actually make it much clearer for us to have um, well-functioning meetings. And um, I'll leave it there. So I imagine Councillor Panna, it's probably best for you to speak now and get those amendments out. Oh, you, you will see now. Thanks. Piece of paper. Um, 
Do they only give us one? All right. Um, well, look, obviously I'd like to thank officers too for the work that they've done. Um, any improvements are much uh, welcomed. Um, I still have to say, because I'm not a lawyer, I do find them <laughs> dreadful. There's, it's still quite, you know, rule-bound, you shall do this, you shall not do this, so possibly not entirely my style, but, um, look, it's important to put the rules out clearly. Um, uh, look, I'm just going to speak briefly. Um, just in terms of the conflict of interest uh, provisions which I've put in, which is about uh, leaving the room rather than removing yourself just from the table, um, this is not a, a criticism of any one particular elected member or anything or any reflecting on any experience, but I just I think it's in uh, everyone's interest if it's really clear that if you have declared a conflict of interest, and I've done that, I stood outside the council door one time um, over a local matter, um, that it's just really clear that you have that conflict and you are not sort of sitting at the table um, with the perception that you have the potential to influence uh, colleagues. So I think it's just, it's just keeping it nice and clear and um, in a small city and a small country, I think um, that's helpful. Um, and saying it for a non-financial interest as well. Um, see, um, Councillor Fitzsimons, I just picked up your one. Uh, I, I don't see why we would put 20 as the minimum number. Um, one person can have a great idea, um, and 500 people might not have a good idea. So I think, look, as long as it's got one, obviously we will have a look at that. <laughs> if, a, if a petition's got three people on it, and it's, you know, like that might... But nevertheless, I don't think we put up barriers. I think if people want to participate, um, they should be able to. Um, I have put at number D. Um, now, um, I've said this to you. I just think um, that while we do offer, ask for officer advice and debate, um, generally we should try as elected members to be um, getting our amendments in so that we um, don't need to do that because I think it does get a little bit tricky. Um, so all we've got is just some wording in there that um, it's possibly not the wording I would have used, actually. Sorry, I don't know. Where, sorry, where did this come from? Actually, sorry. I Yeah, yeah you've got a suggestion change. I... It doesn't quite work because it doesn't bring in the fact that it's, there's a professional opinion that comes with yeah, this. It's yeah. not so just it's about facts. Pro profesh that yeah, so I, so I think Councillor Fitzsimons had some wording. It's a professional opinion is fine, but just the, um, the my request is that it's clear that people do not enter into political debate because sometimes there is a fine line, um, particularly when we, for example, get into questions of representation, which I think then definitely gets into our space. So. Councillor for Simons, you might, you could speak, um, yeah, could you just put that up because I think it was um, better. And I don't want to be, um, the wording to be critical of officers, so that's not, yeah, that's not quite the right way of putting it. Um, and then the last one is, look, this is, we are an outlier on this one. Um, the question of who the paper belongs to is an interesting one. Um, while we obviously do rely on our officers for um, advice, we also have a role as elected members to lead on issues. So, for example, the submission that we did on biodiversity, where absolutely there was some leadership from councillors um, around the tone, around our commitment, around the vision, um, and that needed that political leadership. Um, and we, we are different to every other council on this particular point. You know, my preference is that... Um, once the paper is published, it does become the councillor paper. Anyway, I'm not going to have a big argument about that. What I would just like is that we um, we specify that you don't need two uh, different seconder. So, sorry, Cyrus, have you got that wording? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, councillor Pennant, yes, this, the, the, the way it's being worded out, it, it removes the second seconder requirement. So okay. It yeah. will be labelled as performer, but the changes will be there in red. And so sometimes, look, just from an administrative point of view, sometimes it can just be a pain to have to go run, running around trying to find um, different seconders. But I think we do need to be clear that, um, yeah, that people do have some ownership over the paper, that they will have views, they will have stood on a, a platform of a particular view. Um, and that is fine for them, whatever that point of view is, whether I agree with it or not, um, they do have a right to be able to articulate that. So I think um, 
this was very much about keeping councillors out of the papers, actually. I was here when, when it was introduced, and I don't think it's actually necessary. Thank you. I'll respond to any comments. I will... Uh, um, is there, do you have a seconder? We have, but it's... Officers will provide their professional opinion but must maintain political neutrality. Is that all right? Is that all right, yeah. everyone? Yep, OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, no, I'm no, going to speak to it in a minute. No, I am, the reason I'm doing that is because, yes, it might be the convention, but it needs to be clear in the de because you do not have, in Parliament, CEOs turning up and interjecting into debate. So I just want to be really clear... Yeah, no, but it's the same system. It's a similar system of government that we have. That we have. No, no. Well, hang on, I haven't finished. That um, that we have. We're really, really clear about the distinction, at least in our roles, that officers must not come into debate and give an opinion which then might sway the councillors. I don't think it's appropriate. I think I did raise some concerns publicly about a representation question a couple of weeks ago, where I think that is that is very much a line call about what's. Um, um, advice or not. Um, so, look, all it's just saying is you provide your professional opinion, which is what um, your job, you know, your job is to do, but must um, maintain political neutrality. Do we Thank have you. a seconder for these amendments? Thank you. Would you like to speak? To, would you want to reserve your right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just going to speak to a couple of them. Um, I guess the first two, I'm not entirely sure that. I think if, sitting up from my from what I've observed in the past, sitting back from the table seems to be enough. Um, people don't engage um, when the debate is happening, and it's a conflict of interest. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's because there's concern about pressure from people sitting there, or um, you can re obviously reply to this in your reply. Because I mean, obviously, the person can go out and watch it on their phone or whatever, so they're going to see it. If it's just about the fact that maybe there might be pressure from the person sitting there, whether it's visual or whatever, um, that's also public, like it would be very easily seen and it would be called out. So I guess it's just, I'm, I want to understand really what the issue is around that and I think you can probably speak to that in your right of reply. Um, around D, I guess I'm sort of looking at this from a chair perspective going, this is a very, a very tricky one because um, there are times where I think it's actually really important councillors have the opportunity to hear the officer advice because we actually do want to understand the implications of what might be being put forward. And then it becomes, a, well, where does that line... How does the chair decide if it is political or is it not political? It's actually incredibly hard to pick. I actually think um, nine times out of ten you could get it wrong. And then it means that councillors might miss out on the opportunity for advice that they would really appreciate um, in making sure that they're making the right decision. I think it's kind of... The Local Government Act does does um, direct us into how to manage those relationships and um, we're not always going to get it right but I just worry that having that in there um, makes it incredibly tricky for people to give um, good advice and, and feel that they can request that as well and it, it puts a lot on the chair to try and figure out if it's political or not political and uh, yeah, I'm not really very comfortable with that one. Um, very happy with E though and yeah, C happy with as well. So, um, and thank you, um, Councillor Pennant, for going over this carefully and bringing your your experience as well. So, we'll be um, sharing what you think in your right of reply, uh, Councillor Wolf. Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair, and um, th thanks, Councillor Pennant, for bringing this up. Um, I will be supporting you on. Um, the um, two um, conflicts of interest declaration, because I believe from uh, organisations that I've been in previously that it is of a benefit that um, members, when they do have a, a conflict of interest, are, are not in the room um, for some things. If they've declared a conflict of interest, that is it. And if they are in the room, there is often the perception that there, there could be some interference, even though there isn't. Um, sometimes, so yeah, leaving the room, I think, is a, a, a professional way of, of um, acting. There, there are many incorporated societies that I've been involved in where um, it's right and proper to, to, to leave the room, and you know, I've done it myself um, voluntarily um, in CCO um, on CCO boards. I just think that this is good practice. Councillor Paul. <laughs> Still thinking about some of them, but I think C, like the whole one signature thing, I don't know about this, like, this is just going to take a lot of time, a lot of officers' time to prepare. 
the paper for one signature. I just don't think that's what a petition is, and I think it kind of um, it kind of overlaps with what our job is, which is to meet with you know if there's one person with a concern that can't get additional signatures, then probably we should just be meeting with them rather than having a um, you know, dedicating a debate to what one person thinks. And I think it could also have some perverse outcomes as well. I think some people um, with possibly hateful views can bring things to the table. And, <clears throat> yeah, I just think there's a reason that there's a number there. And I just looked up the definition, and almost everyone says that it needs, like, a number of people to sign it. So, yeah, won't be supporting that one, but still think about the others. Yeah. Councillor Calvert. Thank you. Um, um, just the first amendments with the around the financial um, interest. I would be comfortable that they would leave the table. I, I, I'm not certain leaving the room will make much of a difference. Um, I mean, like this is being streamed, you can see what, what's going on. Um, so I think it's it, it's a clear sign if they r remove themselves from the table, the debating table, this, um, and move to the side. It, it, I think it would just be a bit more pragmatic and practical. Um, um, I agree with Councillor Paul about the um, only having one signature on a petition. Look, we've had people talking to us today in public participation. They they still have, can have a voice. Um, um, a petition is a different thing, and, and, and it's requiring officers to go away and do stuff and, and that. And, and, and I think it devalues... A petition as well. When you just say, you know, you know, I just have what, just me, my signature. So, look, I can't support that. Um, I, I'm not going to support um, D. Um, I, if if our council um, worked in such a way where you got every single amendment the day before and. And every, you know, officers had an opportunity to provide some feedback. And we, as elected members, had an opportunity to consider the stuff. But when we get amendments, sometimes on the fly, um, um, I appreciate that officers, often officers were giving us information on the fly too. So, um, I, and at the end of the day, the chief executive, who is our only employee, um, has to demonstrate political neutrality at all times. It's it's inherent um, in the conditions of employment and expectations. So uh, just stating this in this way, I don't think is at all helpful. And it would be more of a, an impediment to us, I think. So I can't support that. Um, I think E looks like it's just a sort of administrative thing, but uh, but I'm going to be really interested to see how many amendments we've got on this paper as opposed to the other ones, because we could spend more time debating all of this than some of the big stuff. Councillor Free, Deputy Mayor Free. Um, look, I think that we actually don't trust our officers enough, and um, Cyrus, you've got a long, well, I know, through the chair, the, the, you know, I'm very grateful for the work that's been done on this, and we had a workshop, and the officer advice was that some of the amendments that were brought through, there wasn't a problem with them. They've been incorporated. I see a really great willingness of our officers that have worked on this to actually incorporate what they thought actually worked. And so um, I've looked at these um, with an open mind, but I'm bearing in mind the background to this is these actually were the recommendations that weren't didn't have such a high degree of comfort. And bearing in mind, too, the huge amount of work that's gone on with the working group and meeting and um, I'm, I'm looking at some of these. I'm probably going to... I'm not sure I'm actually going to support any of them because I'm not sure they're really adding much at this point. Look, uh, what, leaving the room, the thing I see the difficulty with that is you have to actually stop the meeting, someone has to leave the room, then you have to get them back again. I'm wondering if the actual disruption to the meeting process, given that we're trying to speed things up, is actually worth that. I mean, it's a minor matter. I'd be happy to vote for those probably. The one signature thing, I think Tam summed it up really well. When does it become someone presenting to us at a meeting, which is one person, and an actual petition, which has a bit more weight, and I personally think if it's an important topic, you can get 20 signatures. If there's actually that mood of the community around a topic, you can get 20 signatures. And I think we are asking officers to do a lot of work. Um, we've got to be very mindful of that. Um, I do not see that the extra bit in D really is necessary. And I think it's, as Jill really um, made the point, it's really hard to know what's political P 
opinion and what's a professional opinion. I mean, honestly, this is, I think we're getting, a, I don't see that as necessarily adding anything. And the thing that I feel the most strongly about, though, is actually E. Um, after some consideration, the officer that was working on this actually thought that our Wellington City Council way of doing pro forma works quite well. It's because you can clearly debate the changes to what is our you know, our officer paper. You you have the ability, as the rest of us, to say, no, actually, we don't like the changes. We like the officer's version um, better. And it's quite clear how that works. You've got the officer paper, then you've got the amendments, and you debate the amendments, yes or no. They're not mixed up with the paper that's been brought to you. Uh, to me, this is actually about respecting our officers and about actually saying, we, we value your advice, it's separate from what we might think, and we'll deal with what we might think actually separately, and we know where we stand with that process. And, um, you know, the view of the officer working on this was that actually he's worked in other systems, and he actually thinks that our pro forma has, has some things to recommend it, and it's a system we're used to as well. Thank you. Councillor Rush. Uh, and I think my point's been covered. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor, well done. Councillor Fitzsimons. I just wanted to thank uh, Councillor Pennett for bringing these in, particularly because they do reflect her um, long experience on the council and around this table, and it might be that some of us haven't experienced um, quite the same thing she has, which has given rise to her view that these are important. Uh, and I did just want to comment um, uh, around the financial interests and uh, non-financial interests in leaving the room. I think quite often uh, accusations of a conflict or inter of interest are used to shut people down or make them be quiet. Uh, I know during the last triennium I didn't agree that Councillor Young and um, Mayor Lester had a conflict around Shelley Bay. I don't think that taking a lawful campaign donation can ever arise and make a conflict of interest. Um, I've seen other people try and use conflicts of interest to shut down people they don't agree with. So I am, um, I am I'll cautiously support these, but I do think that um, conflicts of interest are often overstated and, um, and quite often people can uh, have a perfectly legitimate point of view and participate in the debate. Uh, as with integrity. And uh, just in terms of the petition one, I'm not too wound up about it being one. I'd be happy for it to be, you know, three or five. But I think 20 is too high, and we haven't had a we haven't had a limit on it up until this point, and it hasn't been abused. So actually, it's worked fine. And in fact, um, Bernard O'Shaughnessy from Newtown brought a petition to this table about the library opening hours and the weekends at Newtown, and it got changed. He immediately made a difference by bringing a petition. And I think uh, what I often say to people about local government is that you ordinary residents can make changes. You can affect change in how we do things, and there's a whole range of ways to do that. And actually, as someone who's um, been politically active my whole life and always looking for ways to influence uh, decisions and, and run campaigns, I think it's surprising that more groups don't come and speak to us and, and ask for changes that they want to see in the city, and I, I certainly encourage people to do that um, when they come to me with, with good ideas or things they want addressed. Uh, just finally, on the um, maintain political neutrality, I, I will be supporting this. I think it's a very important uh, amendment, and, and it just sends an important message. And even if it doesn't go through, I think it still applies in any case, because what I've observed as a councillor is that there's a massive power imbalance between officers who are very well resourced, who have access to a lot of information, who have big administrative support around them, and councillors. And I think that I've often felt uh, thwarted in my ability to understand an issue or to get the right information uh, simply because there's a whole massive uh, bureaucracy on, on the other side and, and run by officers. And I've found it um, sometimes incredibly difficult to get issues I care about uh, promoted within the council and taken seriously. So I think it's very important that we do have this and we don't have many ways to get things on the agenda of this table. It's actually quite difficult. A notice of motion is one of the few ways. Um, obviously you can work through officers in your portfolio area but sometimes that's very difficult if they have a, a different view to you and there's a lot of tactics that can be used uh, to slow things down and to stop councillors getting to decide on things. So I think regardless of whether this goes through, it's the position anyway, um, but it's to me it's quite helpful to have it uh, in the standing orders. So yeah, thanks uh, Councillor Pennett. These are quite important uh, issues for us to debate, I think. Thank you. Would you like to do a right of reply? Oh, did you want to speak?
On D. Sorry, I just um, essentially have a question around E. So the, the meaning of E is that um, when you're moving a paper pro forma, you, you don't need, you can have one seconder for the paper and the amendments that go with that. Just, it might be, uh, is, might it be useful to have a, a final sentence there that just kind of clarifies it? I don't know. Okay, I was thinking something like any pro forma amendments do not need a separate seconder from the substantive motion. Because it's just we're keeping pro forma, but there's only going to be one seconder for the for the substantive motion and the and the amendment. You can be able to second other things in the future. Yeah, so absolutely. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, the way it's it's written is actually there's no amendment in it, so there is no need for any second seconder. So there is a motion. It's not actually an amendment. It's not actually an amendment. There is no if yeah, that's why you don't need a second. And there is no amendment. It's a it's a motion. It's a motion moved with changes. <laughs> any councillor can move any motion. This is only saying that the changes that have been brought to the motion are distinct rather than just something that has been moved. Yes. It has been labeled as performer so that we're 100% clear, crystal clear that, yeah. Thank you, colleagues. I think um, you've, you've made some constructive and helpful contributions to this debate. Um, look, there's actually some other issues around the standing orders I could raise, but I just I just decided to focus on a few things. Um, look, uh, Councillor Day, I don't, as a matter of form, like to criticise my colleagues. So I don't, when we talk about the financial interest, I don't really want to get into that. I don't think that's helpful. Councillor Fitzsimons, I think your, your point is useful around um, people can still act with impartiality. Um, shutting down people from participating. I think those are valid points. I guess just my um, concern is that we do have quite significant powers as elected members, and I think it's really good to be publicly clear when we do have conflicts. And, you know, it is a very small city. People do uh, put on a number of hats and do different kinds of work. And, you know, that's just the kind of people we are. Obviously, we, we engage in lots of activities. So, um, my thing is about trying to maintain, possibly we will not always achieve it, but trying to maintain high standards. Um, I agree, Councillor Wolf. It's, 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 it's just basic good governance practice, um, and so your experience was um, helpful. I don't think, as a, as a former chair, that it's that disruptive if someone just has to leave a meeting and then come back in. I don't think that's um, too much of an issue. And I think also the non-financial interests, um, that's fair enough too, at a, at a policy level. Um, you know, that there may be some issues where you're advocating for something on one hand, but there might be something else you're also arguing for. So just, just about transparency. Um, in terms of the uh, petition, I have not seen this abused over many years. It, so I agree with you, Councillor Fitzsimons. It's not that much time. In fact, often what we get from officers is, well, they just don't say anything. Um, and as someone who has stood out on the margins and argued hard for cases. I do not believe in majority rules, Councillor Paul, just through the chair. Um, you know, sometimes that one person is the right person, um, and I think um, 20 is very arbitrary, and I don't see why it should be 20. Why, why not make it 100, you know, if you think it has to be of, of significant impact? So I um, don't um, agree with that particular argument. Um, Thank you, Councillor Fitzsimons, for your point. I think that's, and it's, this is not about criticising officers, but the way that um, government, central and local, was set up is that, yes, and particularly for local government, we do, we're not resourced. We don't have a staff that, you know, that gives us advice on um, particularly important matters. Again, uh, my experience is now much better but I have stood outside and said climate change and that has not been taken seriously by this institution. Now people do, but it certainly wasn't, or there's, and there's other issues. Um, and so I think, I think that's a really, really um, important point. I'm not saying, yes, we do put amendments on the fly, I've been guilty of that, but it's, this is not saying that the officers can't partici you know, participate by offering advice. It's just reminding us in our rules, our very important rules, that there must be neutrality. Because I have seen many times, councillor, councillors, people making some statements which could be seen as political. Now, officers, of course, will have political views. That's absolutely um, they're right, but I think we just need to try and 
um, hold that line. It's not about saying no advice. As a former chair, I didn't, you know, Councillor Day, I, I didn't have that issue. I think I, it's a matter of um, sort of experience and judgment about knowing when there's an issue. That, so I'm not, it's not a criticism. It's just, it's just a learning thing. When there is a when there is a line about what's fact and what's going to be political. And you'll, we, we're all getting to know each other and we'll know when things are difficult and sensitive and when you might say to an officer, mm, no, I, I don't think um, you need to go there. And, I, and I'm, I am going to go back to that issue of representation on boards. I just do not consider that that is the sole preserve or a, a, a task force. I do not consider that the preserve of officers, actually. I think in some ways um, sometimes elected representatives will have um, more expertise on that particular point of view. Um, look, this last one is just about just tidying it up. I don't think there's this big need to have rushing around trying to find seconders. We just want to get through our meetings. Thank you very much, colleagues. Right, so we're going to vote now, and I just need to draw... Yes, we are going to do them separately and by division, but I also just need to note that because we're reviewing standing orders that we need 75% to pass, so that's going to be 11 four to have it pass. So it is. I've got it figured, so then we're going to do some counting. Um, so we will do them separately and by division. And we've got our doodickies, so we don't have to do hands and writing. We're going to do the, we're only doing amendments at the moment. Did you have a question? Sure. Not. No, very good question. Through you, Madam Chair. So basically, this uh, um, removes the requirement for having a seconder for the changes that a councillor brings to the motion or the officer's recommendation. So the report, the recommendations in the report have certain recommendations. If on the day or before the councillor decides that and there needs to be certain changes into it, uh, at the moment what we have is move pro forma, move the motion, get a seconder for, the, for, the, for what has been presented to all the councillors, and then get a different seconder for the amendment because the amendment is not in agree all councillors do not agree to that necessarily so it has to be voted upon that what this does is that the changes are going to be clear in the motion so the motion when it's on the screen will show what was changed what deviation was made from officer's recommendation but this is a motion that's moved by the councillor and seconded by another as a totality yeah and if councillors are not happy with parts of it, they can vote by part, part by part, or they can vote it down. Yeah. So it would still be debated separately? The, no. Yeah. Right, we're going to adjourn for a couple of minutes so that we can get this right. I think morning tea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have morning tea. We'll come back at 11. Thank you. Taking out of the standing orders where it says that.
hit the live stream button. Thank you. So we'll just give them a chance give them a chance to um, get the voting sorted. So we're going to vote on these separately. We were just checking whether we needed 75%, but we do. Yep, separately. Yep. Okay, so this is um, for a... Through you, Madam Chair, this is conflict of interest for finan financial. Yes. Eight, so that doesn't pass. That fails. So now we're going to do 4B, which is conflict of interest um, non financial. Yeah. <laughs> we can probably predict this one. So that one also fails. Um, and it was three again, uh, three, no, three, four. Uh, and so now we're doing 4C. This is um, around the petitions and one signature. So that one also fails. All right. <laughs> voting is voting. Um, D, so this is around um, the information that we might get or ask for during debate. Neutrality. The revised wording. Oh, yeah. So that one is lost. Uh, and then E, which is the pro forma. So that one's carried. Just. Just. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, councillors, for persevering, and thank you for asking questions to get seek clarification. It's really important that people do that, so I really appreciate you doing that, Councillor Foon. Um, now we've... Is there anyone else? Does, would anyone else like to speak to the substantive? So we've done those amendments. Those are Councillor Panett's amendments. Is anyone else wanting to speak, or are we ready to... Vote. Oh, Councillor Rush, what would you like to do? I think um, Cyrus was going to draft it for me. I haven't seen it. So this is, relates to the casting vote. Uh, it's proposing that the casting vote be um, uh, retained by the Mayor, um, failing whom the, the Chair. Um, it, should I do my... This is not a reflection of you at all, Councillor Day. How would you propose that works today? Yeah, failing whom would be the chair? Casting vote to the mayor. So my, my thinking here is, and it's certainly n nothing to do with um, the current year at all, but the mayor campaigns on major issues, gets elected by people across the whole of the city, all of the wards, um, and as a consequence, I think probably has a mandate to actually um, have that casting vote. So that's... That's my reason. Um, do you have a seconder? Have you organised someone? Oh. Councillor Young. Would you like to speak to that, Councillor Young? Councillor Pennett. 
Here we go, Council Rush. Absolutely not. I will not be supporting this. Um, look, uh, apart from the fact the mayor isn't here, which is interesting, um, I think, um, look, we um, operate a model where we try and share responsibility um, because actually the mayor is only one vote, as we uh, rem remind ourselves on a regular basis. I think we put the person in as chair to exercise uh, good judgment, and um, I think Councillor Day exhibited good behaviour um, when that call was made. It was a struggle for her, that, that, you know, like which, which way it was going to go, she acted appropriately um, and I think um, that we are, uh, look the whole point about the casting vote, I don't even like it, I'm, I'm more a consensus builder I think, rather than you know trying to win things by one vote, it's better to try and just work that out through debate Would anyone else like to speak to it, Councillor Calvert? I wasn't going to, but very briefly, is I mean, I think if you can only get half the votes, then something probably shouldn't go through. Um, anyway, so I'm not a big fan of the casting vote. Um, but look, I, I think Councillor Rush's um, is right. Yeah, you know, the mayor gets elected. We don't appoint the mayor ourselves, like the the chair of the Greater Wellington Regional Council. The mayor is elected by all the people. So I, I'm, I'm actually going to support this. I'd just like to say I don't think the Mayor is elected by all the people. He's elected by some of the people. So just, just remember that and remember how close it is. Um, Councillor Fitzsimons. Yeah, I, w I won't be supporting this, mainly because it just goes against all meeting protocols and the whole nature of the... Sta it, it's sort of a violence to the whole nature of the standing orders where the chair is in control of meetings. And we have a situation where we don't have the mayor chairing our sort of working committee, that is this committee. And so it would be a bit strange to hand over that to somebody else who's not even chairing the meeting. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's wise, and I think the Mayor has plenty of power, including statutory power, to do things like introduce an annual plan, so I don't think there's any problem with the lack of power that a Mayor has. Councillor Free, sorry, Deputy Mayor Free. Oh, thank you. Um, look, I just, I, I'm not going to support this, and the main reason I'm not going to support it is there's nobody actually involved more in the meeting and there for the entirety of the meeting than the chair. Whereas it, it often is the case that other people are a bit distracted or in and out of the room. So I think it's appropriate that the chair actually does have the deciding casting vote because they would have heard the whole debate. Yep. Councillor Rush, would you like a right of reply? Councillor Pannett, and I, I'm very disappointed that you would suggest that I'm moving this because of a vote that was taken some weeks ago where uh, the chair exercised her casting vote with my support, I might add, and encouragement, uh, and uh, on, a, on a fairly minor issue anyway. Um, so it is certainly not being driven by that at all. I'm at pains to make that clear. Um, Councillor Fitzsimons, yes, the chair does control the meetings. It's a process function, a regulatory function, not uh, one that uh, uh, d to deliver democracy, which is what my submission here is, is that to ensure that the people who vote and are, who we represent are heard, the most appropriate person in the room, if he happens to be here, is the mayor. <laughs> yeah, but it, he's a guy at the moment. Okay, so so f f for me, this is really just about reflecting uh, democracy, as I mentioned. And uh, Councillor Free, I, I understand that um, you know the chair usually, I assume, does does sit through most of the meetings. But I go back to trying to give, trying to give uh, effect to the the wishes of the majority of people, and. Uh, um, you know, the, the chair of uh, any particular committee will be a, uh, a duly elected member, but just from one ward, really, and uh, and not from across the whole city. So, uh, as a consequence, uh, giving effect to democracy is what this amendment's about, and I encourage you to support it. Let's vote. So you know the the ropes. Ooh, change that. <laughs> so that's lost. All right, so now are there, is there any other um, debate to the substantive motion?
Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, just briefly, really like to stand as a long-term, long-time local body government nerd um, that has uh, been trying to engage with different councils within the region for over the last five or six years. That um, the standing orders often aren't very accessible, and I just like to um, acknowledge the officer's work in putting things into plain language so that it is readable. One thing I will note, though, um, with the added appendices, we are increasing our standing orders booklet by another 30 pages and so um, and I've sought assurances through offices as well that hopefully we can have sort of a, um, a cheat sheet or an important shorter um, four pages or something um, yeah sure um, but but that uh, the standing orders are not just for governors, but to reiterate Councillor Panett's point, if you don't have a legal background, that it is often quite hard to engage in these things. So I am looking forward to hopefully being able to um, translate the way that we do governance and processes a little more clearly to the public as well. But yeah, yeah just on that. Thank you, Councillor Foon. You would like a cheat sheet. Oh. <laughs> all right, so that's all of our speakers on the list. Would you like a light of a light? <laughs> Would you like a right of reply? I feel like we have had a very robust debate and lots of work's been done, so no, I don't need to say anything else. Right, we're gonna vote on these. Would councillors like anything taken separately? Great, we're just gonna vote on it all together. We've already we've already um, had things taken as a division, so people know how we feel about the individual things. Right. <laughs> we need 75%. Oh, look at that. Unanimous. Yay. Sorry, we've made Cyrus's day. So <laughs> thank you so much for your work on this, Cyrus. Excellent work. Uh, we are going to move on to item 2.1, um, and I invite Councillor Fitzsimons to introduce the Wellington City Council Housing Strategy and Housing Action Plan 2020 to 2022. And another another matter that has had uh, quite strong <laughs> universal support. Um, I just want to start by thanking officers for the work on this, uh, particularly John McDonald and Rebecca Tong. It's been a, a long, long, hard slog, and they have been diligent and dedicated in their commitment to these issues. And I also want to acknowledge the officers in each of the four priority areas outlined in the action plan. We have many people in this organisation working on planning for growth, the one-stop shop, city housing sustainability, the homelessness strategy, and uh, areas of proactive development. And it's very important and meaningful work in Wellington's history. I just thought I'd take a very brief moment to reflect on the history of this project. And I wanted to acknowledge the former Mayor Justin Lester, the former Deputy Mayor, Paul Eagle and former portfolio leader Brian Dawson, who did the hard yards on this work actually. And I think it's quite helpful to put the work that they did into a context uh, of what has happened at the Wellington City Council. And it does reflect a uh, wee bit on the issues that Councillor Panett was raising earlier today. Um, Justin Lester and Paul Eagle got a work done on this in opposition to officers at the time. There had been 30 years where this council had played quite a passive role in housing. The view was that it wasn't our place uh, to be active in the housing space. And this was seen as particularly problematic by those political leaders at the time. They had a deep frustration that they couldn't get issues around housing affordability and housing supply on the agenda of council. And that's what led to the Deputy Mayor at the time announcing the Mayor's Task Force on Housing because he, in his view, we had reached a crisis point in housing. And I just want to note that that task force was a, a very high-powered task force. It was led, it was actually announced when the Chief Executive was out of the country, which Kevin Lavery found apparently quite controversial at the time. But actually what's happened since has shown the power that when political leaders can work with officers, you can get things done. 
and we do have a lot of things to get done. In Wellington, we have the highest rents in the country. Our housing is at crisis point, and we have a big social and economic risk facing our city. Soon, we know, if we don't act, people will not be able to come and live in Wellington in the same way they have in the past. We've already heard from students that they're worried they won't be able to finish their degrees in this city because of the high rents. And so I just wanted to um, mention the, um, yeah, the work of, of those political leaders, uh, the members of the task force at the time, who were a number of high-profile people from um, developers to community leaders to those working with uh, people struggling with housing affordability um, and also to those social housing providers who were all part of that um, Mayor's Task Force. And I also wanted to talk about the fact that the Mayor's Task Force and the work that's been done in this action plan has enjoyed a political consensus around this table. There has been strong political support uh, from across um, the various kind of ideological and other backgrounds that we come from. People have been very supportive of this housing action plan and the work the council's doing in the housing space. I want to thank Councillor Calvert for raising issues around um, particular time frames and officers have welcomed that feedback and have made that clearer in the updated housing action plan we're considering today. I also wanted to thank Councillor Foon for her comments around sustainability and waste and I know that officers are taking those uh, particularly seriously. And Councillor Matthews for raising accessibility issues again and again officers have been pleased to be able to be responsive and put that on the agenda. And I and I hope that we'll see further examples of political leadership from around this table uh, to deal with the housing crisis. I also just wanted to note what I think is one of the most um, useful uh, pillars of this Housing Action Plan, and that is around proactive development. So I guess my message to councillors is if you have an idea in housing, speak up. Talk to me, talk to the officers, talk to the chief executive. There are options for us to be more active in this space, to partner with particular providers. Um, and to get things happening. The Central City Apartment Conversions Project was again something that officers were, I think that they really struggled with at the time. And um, I was talking to, to Paul and Justin about it this morning and they were saying that the way they ended up announcing that policy was by media release. And then they got the officers on board and then they had to um, get the council in behind it. So there has been some uh, political leadership shown to get us on this journey and that has um, resulted in consensus around this table and very, very active approaches and engagement by officers with a whole range of people. So I guess what I'm trying to say is culturally the Wellington City Council and politically is acting in a different way in the housing space and perhaps if that had happened in the previous 30 years we wouldn't be facing the needs, the problems we're facing now. And I just finally wanted to comment about the, um, the request that we make sure this is part of our risk assessment going forward because um, I think that's very important. We do need to monitor it. It's our role as governors. But I guess I also just want a bit of a plea that we do need to take some risks. We do need to take some risks in this space. And some of our projects may even have some high risks of failing, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and properly consider them because... Um, the challenges are very real and are very big and they're impacting on people every day. So this isn't the last you'll hear of this important issue, but I ask um, that the political consensus in favour of Wellington City Council playing a more active role in housing continues. Do you have a seconder? Who would like to see this? Councillor O'Neill, who would like to speak? Um, uh, can I reserve my yes. right to speak? Thanks. Would anyone else like to speak to this paper? Councillor Pennant. So we'll just do a little rewind. Um, <laughs> Councillor Fitzsimons had a, an amendment that she was putting forward pro forma. Oh, uh, Councillor Fitzsimons, we'll do it to the next one. It's the challenges of having two papers in one day. We will cut you some slack. Councillor Pennant. Um, look, um, thank you, Councillor Fitzsimons, and for your leadership in this role, and of course, yes, acknowledging our former colleagues for the work that they did too. Um, I think this is good, and we should continue with it. Um, just make a couple of points though. First of all, the um, when we got our money from the government to do the housing upgrade, that's where a lot of this organisation's focus went. You know, it was a huge, huge job to upgrade um, these um, buildings which um, were in much need of um, of that upgrade. Um, and this, the, um, the district plan was supposed to deliver 
you know, the houses that we needed. And I guess there's a, um, because, you know, we were told there was enough land, I guess there is a, a learning in that that just uh, letting the market provide um, won't always work. Um, look, just and just if you could respond to this, I guess um, the city is looking to us to see what we're going to do on housing. And i just referring to my question on Tuesday about, you know, how many houses are we actually going to be delivering this trainium? Um, so we're going to get some more um, information on that um, next month, I think. Um, so that will be helpful. But I certainly... Um, will do whatever I can to support you in your drive like uh, through the work for planning for growth to make sure that we continue to actually get them built. Um, you know, and I know how um, hard some of our former colleagues worked to even just get the Arlington deal across the line. It was so much work and yet there's still so much more need. Um, but I think we just need to be responsive to our community. They're saying that we need action and these things have been in the pipeline, which is good. Um, but I think we need um, probably an escalation. And so next month we'll give us some idea about where the advice is coming from and maybe through our long-term plan as well. Kia ora. Uh, um, I'll just I have a few comments. Um, I just want to acknowledge everyone who's been involved with this up till now. Um, completely um, acknowledge Councillor Fitzsimons. This is a challenging space to be to be leading in, and you're doing an excellent job. So thank you, uh, and our staff who um, work tirelessly um, to try and stretch that little bit further all the time to look for solutions. Um, and I'd like to speak to uh, the opportunities last training around apartment conversions and how challenging that was. It was it was a brave thing um, in leadership to step forward and say we want to do this and we, we really think it can work but actually for the officers I really want to acknowledge how hard that is because the impact that it has on officers who are already they have work programs that are really full to then turn around and try and grapple with with this um, is really amazing and the fact that we have made that work is a real testament to the officers and the effort and energy that they've put to this because it certainly wasn't wasn't easy at that, those early phases so I guess from my perspective I want to say so we need to be creative and brave because creativity did bring something quite different and I want to see us continue to be creative and actually then it leads on to partnerships are crucial. So the partnerships with um, other agencies, organisations and people who have the knowledge and the ability and the power to be able to do something because council can't do it on our own. So um, we really need to foster and support those people out there who are also equally trying to make a difference in our city and are willing to put something forward that has risks for them as well. So we have to acknowledge that risks do sit with us, but they also sit outside of council and um, it's important that, that we support those organisations. And I just want to say I know that um, mana whenua are, um, are experiencing at the moment lots of opportunity through the RFR process, the right of first refusal, and there are lots of opportunities there for us to work with mana whenua around the sort of housing that we would like to see in the city. And um, I'm really pleased that we're working through our MOU at the moment, getting ready to um, celebrate and sign that on the 29th of April, but there are so many opportunities with mana whenua um, around developing in the city and, and making this a city that people feel that they can come and live in and, and it's theirs. Um, so next speaker is Councillor Rush. Thanks Madam Chair. Um, like yourself, I just want to pay tribute to the officers who prepared this. Uh, when I first looked at it, I thought there were a number of gaps, but uh, they were answered um, with um, good evidence um, that uh, convinced me that this was a great plan that had been worked well uh, and hard and uh, if, if tribute needs to be paid to previous members of this forum then I'm more than willing to do that. I'll be supporting this. Councillor Calvert. Um, thank you. Um, can um, you just scroll down to um, recommendation 7 because I, I moved some an amendment and I wanted to see whether it's been addressed. Yeah, yeah no, can I just, can you just scroll down to see what it looks like now? Yeah, okay. So I just want to, um, I'm just going to touch on briefly why I think this is a, um, appropriate to have this in. Um, um, I appreciate the improvements that have been made in the, in the first two years of our action plan towards the strategy. Um, it, uh, a first action plan is always a little bit difficult. Um, I think this one is worded better and, and also with the amendments because it's important that we're actually quite clear on the milestones that we're looking for. 
Um, I've suggested rather than annually that we do look at it every six months because if we only looked at this annually, we'd only have one review, and that's not enough time for us to make adjustments. We know we have some challenges in particular coming up over the next six to 12 months, and some of the things, some of the projects in particular that we think um, are based on um, on things that are, that are currently on the horizon not happening and when I'm talking about COVID-19 so we don't know what's going to happen about some of these developments so we need to be agile and as good governors it's appropriate housing is a priority for us so it's appropriate that we do monitor it on a regular basis and it's also um, important that we do monitor the strategic risks of this and ensure we've got the right um, mitigations in place that is good governance so Anything has risks, so it's not about being afraid of um, having risks to any project, but it is about um, making sure that those risks are managed appropriately. And so calling this out in that is, um, is, is appropriate. Um, and I think that is about this. But the other thing, the only other final point is anything is a systems approach. And so dealing with housing, it's not just about what we're doing, but also understanding what um, our partners and others are working in the field. So I see this housing action plan as being, um, it's not just it's not just ours, but it is, and I think as officers have rightly pointed out, is it's also about other partners working in this space, which we probably have a little bit less control over, but nevertheless it does um, it does support what we're trying to do and essentially seeing more houses right across the spectrum in our city being built as quickly as possible. Um, so, um, yeah, so thank you for making those adjustments and I will be supporting it. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, so um, really, really happy to second this paper and to um, acknowledge the work that's been done previously. Um, I had a bit of a moment the other week when um, I think it was um, Deputy Mayor Free brought in a big ring binder that said Te Mahana 2014 on it um, and I opened it up and I saw um, Paul Legal's handwriting and that was quite a big moment for me because in 2014 it was the first time that I started engaging with this council over housing and for um, and for, for a larger focus and um, supporting our homeless people and, and working towards that strategy. So um, we know that housing is one of Wellington's biggest challenges and house prices have stabilised around, much around the country but they continue to rise in Wellington. Um, as Councillor Fitzsimmons has noted, Wellington is now surpassing Auckland in their um, average rental pricing. We know that we are 4,000 homes short of what we currently require and predicted population growth will push that higher without additional efforts. Um, uh, Wellington has some of the highest rates of renting in the country. More than 60% of us rent, and at this table today, I, um, I believe we've got um, Councillor Paul and Councillor Fitzsimmons who are also renters as well, so it's good to have um, that, that voice at the table. Yeah. Um, Actions to address homelessness are working, but wraparound services are needed to ensure that once people are housed, they can maintain tenancy, and that goes beyond our own social housing practices as well. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the four outcomes outlined in this strategy, and that is the first one is for a well-functioning housing system for efficiency and supply. Um, the next one is resilient homes for warm, dry and energy efficient and sustainable. The third one is to reflect the housing need for Wellingtons, Wellingtonians. Um, and the fourth one is that our housing supports well-being, particularly for those that are the most vulnerable. Um, I'm really excited to see this action plan come into full swing and uh, certainly have seen been, in my own experience last year, um, my I held two jobs and for my main income, my rent was 120% of that income. Um, and I know that so many of my other friends this year are still kind of in that place and that is a bit of a struggle, but the, the best thing that we can do is increase housing supply. So I'm really excited to see this action plan come into swing. and. Um, just a to talk or a lot of the other points and to acknowledge uh, former Mayor um, Justin Lester, Brian Dawson and then uh, Paul Eagle as well. Cheers. Thank you. Wish they were here to see this. Um, Councillor Matthews. 
Kia ora koutou. Um, I guess one uh, one thing I always talk about with accessibility is that it, if it's better for disabled people, it's better for everyone. And uh, the, the opposite, unfortunately, is also true, that uh, the housing crisis is, uh, you know, felt by many, many um, parts of our community, but even more keenly so um, by disabled Wellingtonians. And um, to quote... Uh, uh, Erin Goff, who's sort of been an activist and uh, around these issues, and recently met with the UN Rapporteur on Housing. Uh, finding an accessible home in Wellington is basically a lottery at this point. Um, there's an undersupply, and um, it really gives uh, disabled people the issue that comes up most uh, commonly. Um, the, uh, so I would like to thank office for, officers for being so responsive and really getting this issue um, uh, sort of uh, give it a high profile in this plan. Um, the, the issues can be very complex and uh, I got an email this morning, I think maybe last night, from Dr Tristram Mingham who's co-chair of our Accessibility Advisory Group um, and he's listing some of the issues about zoning to permit accessible dwellings, um, universal design and buildings, sense and compliance of access, accessible buildings and of course the provision of social housing. So I'm very keen to continue to work over this triennium to do what we can to address um, the many issues that disabled Wellingtonians face in trying to find appropriate housing. Um, just also I guess a personal reflection and, and um, adding to, to uh, Councillor O'Neill's comments about being a renter and I guess going through that process of having rented in my 20s and, you know, then being a homeowner and now going back to renting again, um, that it's really not what it used to be. And I don't know if councillors will be necessarily aware of how it's changed in terms of the competition that is there, sort of a cutthroat competition to find somewhere to live, um, that... Uh, the intrusion um, that now, you know, the things like the property inspections that you have and now it's kind of telling you that you've got too much lint in your dryer and uh, filter, those kind of things that didn't exist uh, for me when I, when I rented the first time around. It's kind of a dehumanising thing about your home and the level of, of detail um, that's willing to be dwell, uh, delved into by your landlords. Um, but I guess the main one is the insecurity and that fear no matter where you sit, I'm very fortunate as, you know, having a, a good family income, but that insecurity that, you know, what would happen if this house is sold or we can't live here anymore, where are we going to live? Where are the kids going to go to school? All of those kind of questions. So um, I really do think it all points to um, us playing the most active role that we can in the housing market. So I commend my councillor colleague uh, Fleur and officers for the work and um, really excited to be part of this work. Councillor Fitzsimons, would you like a rush to reply? Look, just very briefly, um, particularly Iona, who's asked me to respond um, about how many houses we're going to be delivering this term or be be um, enabling to be delivered. I guess um, one of the things, that one of the challenges that we all have with the planning for growth work is that we need to find a way to give a voice to people who aren't yet here, but we're planning to for them. Um, and I think that is going to need some brave leadership in the community because some of the conversations and discussions with the community will be very challenging to those people who already own homes here. So um, y yes, I agree. Uh, in terms of Jill, I just want to, uh, Councillor Day, I just want to acknowledge the um, opportunities for working with mana whenua and making sure that we do everything we can to support the kind of partnerships they have that's going to deliver particularly increased housing for the city. Councillor Calvert, uh, thank you for your, as I said in my introduction, thank you for your uh, suggested amendments in terms of monitoring the strategic risks of the project. That is welcome. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Councillor Matthews and your commitment to accessibility because I think uh, already you're making a difference in terms of getting that reflected and it will turn into action. Um, so yeah, and the other thing I did want to um, comment on is some of the issues that people have raised in terms of the rental market are things that I didn't face when I was a renter as well and that I hear from people who are now looking for accommodation, uh, particularly around that intrusion, landlords asking to look at your Facebook profile to do some sort of assessments of your social circles and really, really challenging numbers of people turning up at flats to view them uh, when they do become available for rent. And one of the things that council officers are 
we're currently working on is our submission to the review of the Residential Tenancies Act. So that will be coming before us in a few weeks and that will give us an opportunity as a council to take a position um, of advocacy towards government on those issues too. Thank you. So we're ready to vote. We'll see and we'll take it all together. Voting is open. Let's carry unanimously. Yes. That represents a lot of work, even though it's on one page. <laughs> it represents a lot of work. Yes. Um, so now I'd like to bring a busy, busy day here, Councillor Fitzsimons. Would you like to in introduce the social housing policy paper? I promise you'll hear less of me next week. Um, so yeah, just introducing this this paper. I do want to start by um, sincerely thanking officers for the work on this, particularly Michelle Rewai and Angela Hewitt, who have done a huge amount of really complex, detailed data analysis modelling. Um, but also uh, have injected into this a real sense of compassion and consideration of the individual circumstances of our tenants. And that is, um, I think, outlined in what we see today. I also just wanted to start off by um, sharing the frustration that many councillors around this table have about the government's reluctance to open the income related rent scheme to our city housing tenants. The very first email I sent after the Mayor told me that I would have the housing portfolio was to our local MP and the Minister of Finance Grant Robertson asking to have discussions with him about the income related rent subsidy. I've since raised it with uh, the Minister Chris Farfoy. I know that local government New Zealand have been very active on the back of an amendment put forward from uh, Councillor Calvert to the LGNZ conference last year. I know that our chief executive, the current one and the former one and the mayor, have all been current, very, very active on this point. And I welcome more discussions on it. Um, and, I, and I would um, just respond to the comment Councillor Calvert made, which seemed to be dismissing the voice of Mary Hobbs and her ability to influence Grant Robertson. One thing I know about this government is that they do listen to the poor and the vulnerable, and I do think her voice would actually actually make a difference. Putting um, in such a way that suits you. I'll call a point of order too. Do I have to wait for one to be finished? Yes. What is your point? Of, actually, I'll wait the inference is that the previous government did not also care for people. No, that's definitely not a point of no, order. No, my, my point was that when you're thinking about a political strategy for how you want government to change their position on something, you have to think through what are all of the levers and mechanisms you have available. And I'm just suggesting that the voice of Mary Hobbs would be quite a useful one. And Councillor Calvert made a comment that, that seemed to, to the next submitter that seemed to indicate that that wouldn't be as valuable. And I'm, if, I, if I misunderstood that, then I welcome that. Um, and, and, and absolutely, we can have more discussions on this point. We can have our Mayor and Chief Executive leading those discussions, and I, and I welcome that. I also um, just want to reflect on when we originally discussed this issue and when we commissioned the work, the very, very detailed and dense work that we see before us today. That was on the 21st of June 2018, when the council used to meet at the old council buildings. And I actually looked back on the minutes of that meeting and remembered that the current Mayor and I did move a motion that uh, all existing tenants should have their rents grandparented and that changes would only apply to new tenants. We ended up not putting the motion because it was clear it didn't have support around the table. And we instead opted for what is now paragraph D on page 32, which is we commissioned the work to be on the basis that it's at the right price for tenants using the council's social housing rent setting system with changes based with charges based on tenant circumstances, including scenarios mitigating the negative financial impacts for existing tenants. Now I do think we have got some examples where the negative financial impacts for existing tenants will be mitigated, perhaps not in the recommendations, but there is in the option around the rent freezes for those over 80. And I just want to be clear um, with my colleagues and also uh, with City Housing Tenants that I'm quite open to some changes around that. What we have got is a system where we have some small rent reductions and a fairly steep curve of increases. And um, as far as I'm concerned, 
concerned the consultation is a very, very genuine one. We genuinely want to hear from our tenants um, and also those NGOs who support our tenants to, to determine really whether we've quite got it right. Um, and I'm certainly very open-minded to particular things that come through and changes that may be made. I just wanted to comment on uh, two other things. One is the security of tenure, which is a new approach put forward in this. I think that will put us on a par with other social housing providers. It's really about saying, you can stay in your home. This is a genuine home. We're not going to use some blunt policy tool to move you on. Um, as I said, the over 80-year-old rent freeze, personally, I'm open-minded about this. I would like to see exactly how it was communicated. I've already talked to a couple of tenants who are a bit worried about it, and it may well be something that when we get a report back on the consultation, we need to think about more. But I'm comfortable that we consult on this basis at this stage anyway. I also have an amendment to move pro forma. Is it there? One of the things I think this paper um, has in it, if, if you read it carefully, is there's some major alarm bells about the future of city housing in this paper. And you don't need to look very far into the paper. It's on the first page. And also in paragraphs uh, uh, from 88 really to 91, where it talks about the um, financial gains achieved through this policy change will not fully address the financial sus financial sustainability of the service as additional reserves will be needed um, and that, that if we do not generate reserves there will be no funds to invest in property condition resulting again and so it's very clear that we are going to need to do more work particularly around asset management um, and I really want to make sure that we're not just accepting uh, these alarm bells that we're actually setting up a system for a constructive way forward so I'm suggesting there that we we just ask officers to prepare a paper detailing options for resolving the long-term financial sustainability of city housing to be considered during deliberations on the next LTP. And that, to me, is something that we can do that is quite a constructive way of saying, we know we're doing one step, but we still have more to do. So hopefully we'll get some, get some officer advice and analysis of what else needs to be done, and, and we might need to do things a bit differently. Um, there's a lot more in this report, but you've all read it, um, you all know it, and I uh, look forward to hopefully your support. Yes, so, so that's my job to sort that out. Um, so just to remind you, we've talked about standing orders, but at this point in time we're in the meeting where the standing orders we have apply because the standing orders that we've just talked about need to go to council to be ratified. So we need a seconder for the original motion. So who'd like to second the paper? Councillor Rush, you can second the paper. And who would like to second this amendment? Councillor Panett. Uh, so we will now speak to the amendment. Would you like to speak to this? Would you like to speak to the main, to the substantive, or would you like to speak to the amendment? No, I, I don't need to speak to it. Cool. Okay, thank you. It's all right, so you can speak to the. Well, now we are now going to discuss the amendment. Can I do both? Just because I don't want to speak twice and they're kind of related you can anyway. Do both so, um, look, I'd um, like to echo uh, Councillor um, Fitzsimons. Uh, thanks to the officers, they've had a really difficult job here, and they're trying their best to um, deal with what is really an intractable problem. So I appreciate that. Um, look, just my, um, I'm happy for to go to consultation but I am deeply troubled by it and um, I've consistently raised concerns around um, people's ability to pay more. Um, my view is that um, there is little or no discretion in our tenants' budgets um, and that no tenant should have to choose between food and rent or heating or shoes for your children or childcare so you can work to try and make your life better, etc, etc. And um, whilst um, it's obviously a favourable position um, for our tenants to be in our housing rather than the private market, it doesn't mean that their lives are any easier. Um, and so I think we will definitely need to take some feedback on this point of view. And I think um, this is more to my uh, colleagues of a particular persuasion. The new right have been extremely successful in their project over the last 30 years. So yes, yes, thank you, councillors. On this side of the table, I've done um, that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so I will. <laughs> I am smiling, Councillor Rush. Just relax. Um, uh, <laughs> um, 
because I'm, I'm trying to explain to speak for this. that that we suddenly ha- end up having discussions about whether we can afford to provide housing to every person in the city or even every person in this country. This was not the discussion pre-1980 and the pre-1980s and the 1990s. Um, so, so my... Um, please, Councillor Young. Yeah. My concern is that um, I guess that we need, to, and reminder that I think we need to be really aspirational, that everyone should have a, a warm, uh, safe, dry house in, or apartment in the city, um, and they should not have to be made um, really, really hard decisions. And, you know, I $1,000, you know, we were being told on Tuesday, oh, well, that's, you know, there's some discretion there, but really by the time you've gone to the supermarket and paid your power bill and done a few other things, um, even topped up your doctor's visit, there really is no money left. So I take this seriously that we're putting up rents for a very vulnerable group of people. It is frustrating that um, this Labour-led government, supported by the Greens, we have not fixed this. And if there is another um, another term, this is something that um, needs to be fixed. The other thing that needs to be fixed is the, the benefit levels. People aren't being paid enough and, and, and wage rates too. So people need to be paid more ultimately. That, that, that's just where it comes down to. Um, but look, I'd like to thank Councillor Fitzsimons for coming up with this uh, suggestion for an amendment um, that helps to address my concerns. I think there is a such a big, big issue here. And the fa- look, the fundamental point here is that um, social housing needs to be subsidised. You know, like, like it doesn't, and we were told, it doesn't operate unsubsidised. It's exactly like public transport, which does not run as a business. It's a complete myth. Um, so I think um, bringing an amendment which asks for advice from our professional advisors about how we might deal with um, these enormous issues that we have is, is very sensible. I mean, it should be done any time. Um, but, you know, certainly I, you know, my commitment is for this next LTP is to do a big um, lot of investment in infrastructure water, waste, housing. Um, our earthquake-prone buildings continue to be a problem, so we this will be a really good chance to have a first principles look at what we need to do for infrastructure across all those critical areas. So I think this is really helpful. Um, I will, so finally, will support it with a heavy heart and am definitely open um, to amendments because um, I do have concerns about our elderly population, uh, also single parents, um, where there's just, just obvious massive um, inequalities. Thank you. Councillor Free and then Calvert. Look, um, I think, thank you, Councillor Fitzsimons, and you're right to acknowledge our former colleagues. As, um, C- Councillor Dawson in particular was just completely focused on housing, and as a consequence, actually did make quite a, a bit of progress, and I think we are reaping the benefits, and I, I know you're going to carry on the excellent work in that space. My main thing is that we can't actually pretend there isn't a problem, and that's why I actually do thank you also for the amendment. I think we have to face up to the fact that even with the hard decisions we may choose to make around um, some tenants paying some more, um, and it won't be easy for us to make that because we will get the sad stories, and I know we will, they are there. But even with those hard decisions, if we were after consultation to decide to proceed with those, they're really a little bit of a Band-Aid. They make the problem just a little bit less worse, less bad. They don't actually really sort it. Um, But at the same time, um, you know, we we can't pretend, just because we can provide some social housing for some of our city, we can't pretend there's actually not even a more systemic problem out there, which I do take the point. I think the government does have to actually look at people's level of income and the housing costs across the whole of the country, let alone just Wellington, um, and to look at how people who are really needy are being supported. And it's not something we can do on our own. So that whole idea about partnership and um, productive and um, fruitful partnerships is also one we need to be very mindful of. Um, yes. So look, I think we're on the right track. I'm not personally wanting to change this too much before it goes out to consultation. I think the officers have done an enormous amount of work trying to cut a very difficult problem as well as they can. A two years' worth of really hard work. Thank you to Michelle and your team. And I know you have probably sweated um, and dreamt it, walked it, talked it, and every other kind of um, kind of activity you can. I'm sure it's never been out of your mind exactly how to to best do this. So I'm very personally very reluctant to change this before it goes out to consultation. I think. Councillor Calvert. 
Um, yeah, look, I'd like to get some officer advice on this amendment. Um, I appreciate it's at the last minute, and it would have been good to have been shared beforehand, um, as we've been trying to do with our amendments. But the thing is with here, we have asset management plans, and, and they're not as quite as boring as it may sound, because they actually look at the service levels that we're able to offer and the funding requirements. And this is done as part of the um, long-term plan process. So I'm, 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 I need to understand is what what is this different to us as I understood it that we would be looking at the viability of our city social housing under the um, review of the asset management plan um, later this calendar year so I would like officers advice is this is this the same thing but described in a different way Um, so do you think then that in terms of looking at the asset management plan, which is looking at service levels, that we would be able to look at the city social housing as part of that and this included? Or is that better to be, because it's better to look at it all together. So we're not, we haven't got duplication. So this would be basically then under the, when we're looking at the asset management plan. Correct. Yes. Yep. It's making it clear. So yes. So it sounds like they're supporting. Um, and well, then, is that as part of the asset management plan? Should that be put for clarification's sake? Yeah. We become. I don't think Councillor Fitzgerald okay. probably doesn't want it limited to that. Um, would anyone else like to speak to this amendment? Right, let's vote on the amendment now then. Oh, sorry, you do get a right of reply. I was just going to just going to pick up on oh, Councillor okay. Calvert's criticism that I hadn't circulated this and apologise for that, but um, I had raised it on Tuesday, so people were sort of it was in, in people's minds, and I was um, just waiting to see what the best option was, and, and was hoping to discuss it with um, the chief financial officer, and, 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 and was helpfully um, able to discuss it with other officers. So my apologies, but given it's a, just a process amendment, I thought that councillors' minds could be agile. All right, let's let's vote now. Thank you. Um, we don't need to call out now. And that's carried unanimously. Right, so now we're back to the substantive. And Councillor Paul, you would like to speak? Yes. I just, um, I suppose when, like, obviously given my apologies for not being able to be here on Tuesday at the pre-meeting, but I suppose reading through this paper, um, obviously the emphasis well, a lot of the emphasis is on uh, the rent freezing for people over the age of 80. And I, I mean, I, this has probably been done already, but I really just did want to highlight the, um, the struggles of the working poor. And, um, yeah, I don't want to get out a little violin and stuff, but, I, you know, like, my, my mum's a nurse and my dad drives trucks, and I know that there are working families, single-parent families within... Um, and within our social housing portfolio and I just really wanted to um, make sure that their voice was heard and in a meeting like this they're not able to come and participate. They are working or have worked through the night and they don't have an opportunity to speak. I just also wanted to um, talk about the services to door aspect of this and I, um, I, I would like to see a model that is more... Um, is more similar to the Fano order kind of navigator based model. I think that works really well. Um, and for that to emphasise, I guess, health and financial literacy, I think that's something that our um, that our communities need. And I just want us to be really sure that in doing things like implementing the community in action fund, um, that we're not f further siloing these communities. Because I think just looking at that package it runs the risk of siloing these people within um, our 
wherever the housing is and, and I think it's important to be connecting them into the wider community and for them to be a part of our, our wider community. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on that, um, touch on our the, the working families that are um, in, that we are responsible for. Yeah, that's all. I'd just like to speak quickly um, in, um, in support of going out to consult um, but feeling incredibly uncomfortable with the process because I actually really want to acknowledge what you're saying, Councillor Paul, around people's ability to participate and how hard it is to turn up when you actually, the, your, your, your first priority is to turn up to work and to make sure that you get your pay that day. Um, but I have been reassured on Tuesday, officers talked a lot about how they're going to work and reach out to people in our social housing and make sure that everybody gets a chance to understand and to participate. And so I really want to acknowledge officers because they're well ahead of us on that um, and really um, you know, the emotion that we saw on Tuesday from our, our staff was, I think, it's, it's real. You know, our staff are working with these people every day and, and really do want to do the best they can. And I think the thing that I, we have to grapple with is the fact that we have requirements to meet. Um, we have to meet our deed um, and this is hugely challenging. And I really welcome the amendment that we just um, voted on because... We need to we need to be looking at how we can solve this problem in all sorts of ways, and so it's, it's incredibly hard to, to go out to consult on something like this when we all just feel that it's completely unfair to be having to have this conversation. So I, I really welcome um, the hard conversations and the challenges, so that we can really grapple with this and help our community think about what part we can play as as ratepayers. And you know, I think we actually do need to talk about rates funding um, in this, in that yeah community, and a lot of people already think we do contribute rates towards this, so I think we, we actually need to open this conversation up and say, you know, let, let's really look at this. So I, I, I really I really do just want to acknowledge the staff at this point and um, acknowledge Michelle and thank you for your leadership um, and your, the legacy that you are leaving. It is a real shame for us that you're going, um, but I imagine that you'll be watching very carefully to see how we, how we work this one out. Do, please do feel free to pipe in, you know, along the way, tell us what you can see. Um, but yeah, and I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, the people in our community who do support our whanau in all sorts of ways. We've got so many people that go and volunteer and do things to help um, people in, in our social housing. So, you know, it, it's a whole ecosystem that makes it work, but we've got the fundamental challenge of trying to make this work better. And, um, and I really do um, do welcome the fact that we need to have this conversation because we, we don't want the ultimate goal, the ultimate outcome to be that our social housing falls over because we haven't sorted out our deed requirements. So, yes, uh, Councillor Condé. Yeah, kia ora. I just wanted to acknowledge the the kind of the rock and the hard place situation that we're in. You know, as as other councillors have mentioned, we've got the deed that we have to meet, and if we don't meet it, there are significant financial penalties for the council, and that we've got financial sustainability issues here. And I really want to commend officers for the detailed analysis, but also the the really humane analysis that we see here, because I'd like to acknowledge that the way we set rents at the moment is quite a blunt tool. It's a flat discount across the income streams. And in some of this analysis that shows that, that some of the people who are in our council housing are paying only 17% of their, of their income in rent. Now, I acknowledge that even when you don't have a lot of money, 17% is still a lot. Um, but there are many people in Wellington who would be pretty jealous of being able to pay 17% of their income in rent. In, um, in rent. Um, and I also want to acknowledge in the analysis that, that this is about trying to take, trying to rebalance the rents so that some of those who are in a council housing who are slightly better off will pay more so that we can actually support the most vulnerable who are in council housing. And I'd like to note that, you know, our, the analysis shows that 52% of, of our tenants will actually be better off under this um, under this new rates um, rent scenario, and you know just looking at for example single parents, which Councillor Panett mentioned, that you know if you look in the table on page 42 at, at a single parent family, that um, any single parent family earning less than $870 per week will pay less in rent under under these proposals. So I think it's it's great to acknowledge that that. This is a very um, humane analysis that's been presented to us, and I really appreciate that. 
Um, but having acknowledged that, of course, this is going to be stressful. You know, tr talking to people about putting up rents, particularly very vulnerable people, is going to be a stressful process for everyone involved. And I'd just like to echo Councillor Day that I'm really um, confident in our officers and really appreciate the, the reassurance that we got on Tuesday um, that our officers are going to conduct the consultation with great care and compassion. Um, you know, we understand that, that we've got um, tenants in, in council housing who are um, particularly vulnerable or, or have challenges, um, mental health conditions, those sorts of things, and and um, just thank you to all the staff on our front lines who are going to be doing all of that work um, to to have these really difficult conversations and and come back to us with um, some recommendations. So, kia ora. Would anyone else like to speak to this, Councillor Kelvert? Thank you. Um, Look, yeah, um, I acknowledge Councillor put in terms of being um, between the rock and a hard place, and, and it's something that we need to certainly, we have to go out to consult on this, um, because it says part of the financial sustainability of um, city social housing. Um, but I think it's really important that um, um, we actually acknowledge that we're actually probably housing a different, more of a different type of tenant than we were 10 years ago under the deed. So we um, it, we are probably housing more of the tenants that probably would have been housed under state housing if there had been sufficient state housing. And so those tenants would be entitled to a higher subsidy from, th from government. So now what we've got, and, you know, uh, and I thought Councillor um, Paul's comment, the working poor are now having to subsidise those um, lowest income tenants. So rather than the government or the state or whoever funding them, it's actually our working poor who are actually funding this. I mean, and, and, but it is a difficult thing because whilst 52 percent will be better off, there'll be 40 odd percent worse off. So let's the money's coming from a certain group, but I know we're between the rock and the hard place. So this is why it's really important that in the near future, we look at what other options um, we have. And it's not about going out um, and, and talking with government for a handout. It's actually working with them. And 10, you know, 10 years is a long time to when we sign that deed. There's a lot of things happened. But we do need to start off conversations with the government on a formal footing, because what we've had in the last couple of years has been um, meetings between officials to officials, or um, um, or the type of um, um, interaction that um, Councillor Fifi Simons has talked about. So I think it's now time, and um, and I spoke with the mayor, and, and I, I welcome that he is able and willing to meet with the minister. And and actually, um, uh, we had one of our public participants, uh, Bridget, uh, still here and talking about transparency. So we need to be quite, we need to be transparent about this. What is the information that we're presenting? Um, what is the outcome of any conversations? What could we be doing differently? And of course, this will come in terms of a paper coming towards us, um, to us later in the year, and when we look at asset management plans. Um, but we do need to acknowledge that um, normally, the state uh, the state took care of ha um, providing social housing for those most in need, but we are housing a significant, a growing portion of those most in need, which is reducing the amount of social housing that we have for um, um, uh, um, using council the the working poor. And so it's something that we certainly need to look at. Um, so look, I am um, pleased that we are going to start having formal conversations with the government. I think that's really important. Um, so there is a, a record of that. And I think it's also important that, you know, it, um, political neutrality, so that we're not perceived that we are here for, you know, we are actually here for Wellingtonians and not for the Beehive. So I'm really keen to make sure that we do have seen as that neutrality. And um, yes, yeah, so I will be um, supporting these changes um, and I'm looking forward to what does come out of through the consultation. That's really all. 
Um, kia ora, and uh, I just wanted to, to start off again by acknowledging the really hard work by officers and Councillor Fitzsimmons and um, the amount of work that's been put in over these last few years and talking with social housing tenants as well. Um, many of my colleagues know that this is a strategy that is really personal to me. Um, sorry. I, I recall what it was like growing up reliant on social council services and often the health of our building never seemed to be able to escape the families that affected us. Um, I understand how unique we were uh, in the Kilburnie flats to have mould growing up the walls but a fantastic community that wrapped around us and to have and to go back last year and then again this year with um, our ELT member Meredith to look at the way that Wellington City Council runs our housing now is really, really inspiring and just to acknowledge the um, super hard work that's been put into this with tenancy managers as well um, and working with staff on the ground level is really important. Um, I wanted to outline the challenges that we're currently facing and the situation and the, the rock and the hard place that we are in and it's with a heavy heart. Um, that I'm looking at some of these rent increases but also some of the fantastic equitable changes that we're bringing to tenants as well. Uh, in 2007 the council signed a deed of grant with the Crown. The deed involves uh, a 400 million upgrade of the city housing portfolio that, that needs to carry us through to 2037. Currently, um, on graph one and page 43, we are confronted by a graph of doom. And uh, if we don't implement the changes outlined in this policy and find the revenue, then we will currently not meet the conditions of the deed of grant. Um, the rental return does not generate sufficient income in order to be operating these services anymore, nor does it generate any reserves to improve conditions of tenure. Council tenants are not currently eligible for the income-related rent subsidy that Kainga Order and community housing providers receive and make rents more affordable um, and sustainable from the government. Um, over 80% of Wellington City Council's tenants are work and income New Zealand beneficiaries. The largest priority group for city housing customers, a group that compromises of 38% status, are characterised characterise as multiply disadvantaged from many um, many frameworks as well. So to, to understand the different dichotomies that we're dealing with, that it's not just um, considering that a particular person is only a superannuitant or is facing financial or medical hardship, that all of that overlaps as well. Um, under the current proposal, council tenants and low incomes will receive a discount of up to 40% market rent depending on their household income. Uh, tenants who receive a job seeker benefit or smaller benefit will, um, will, will see the most with tenants on higher incomes paying a little bit more for the rent that they do now depending on their circumstances. In terms of tenant equity, and this is something that really stood out to me on Tuesday, the proposed changes will result uh, and tenants on lowest incomes paying less rents or those who can afford to pay more with a little increase in rent. Preliminary engagement with tenants has indicated uh, strong support for this approach. Um, Wellington City Council and this policy have committed to enhanced services door-to-door, -door, prioritisation and needs assessment and asset management that will form the basis of overall city housing policy and framework. Um, I welcome these changes and I'm heartened to see that we can hope to make things a little bit more equitable um, in our paying scheme. Um, for me, personally, I plan to be pretty tough on the government as well and I'm pleased to hear um, both Councillor Calvert and Councillor Fitzsimons acknowledge this as well. Uh, a fairer and more equitable rental scheme is a matter of urgency that this council um, is requiring to pursue for income related rent subsidies. Um, with my background I find it really challenging um, to look at this paper at the moment and I can't accept that we might be going to increase rents for our most vulnerable tenants potentially between $60 to $100 per week and I hope that we're able to look at this um, and, and hear the stories and really um, see people one on one and go to social housing as well. I, 
I am raising the expectation that councillors won't just hear from people from this table, but that it is about it, uh, talking to people in an accessible way. And we are going out to them with our offices as well. Um, in 2018, Wellington City Council leaders appealed to the government as we did in 2019 and now 2020 for income-related subsidies. So um, I hope more formal engagement continues. Um, in our own papers, Wellington City Council tenants are listed as ethically diverse. Um, more, many are elderly, refugees and migrants. Many live with disabilities or suffer from long-term chronic health problems. Some have overcome homelessness, domestic violence and have first-hand experience of discrimination, discrimination and exclusion. Um, that is why I'm here for and at this council table. That is why this is something that is really real for me because I got to see a change for a healthier home personally, but I know that many of my mates back at social housing had to watch painfully over the last decade as we upped our standards. Um, some of those communities are still back in my old block. I still know the families that are living there and I know that they're still struggling. So I'm looking forward to a more equitable approach, but I, it is with a heavy heart that we walk into this and I, I do raise the expectation that we will work really, really hard on engagement to, to find a scheme that suits as many people as possible. Thanks. Councillor Rush. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I too would like to commend uh, officers for uh, walking a very delicate tightrope. And, and I think it's a sign of our times that we are having to show, uh, I guess, more flexibility in our program in order that we can deliver um, and uh, certainly uh, I suspect that the, that the future is going to look uh, somewhat different uh, as prices in, in the central Wellington area continue to rise and that difference between the market rent and, uh, and what is affordable rent just gets bigger and bigger. I do, as a consequence, think that the conversation with the government uh, needs to be reinvigorated. There was a worthy conversation back in 2007, it would seem, where $220 million was offered by the, and taken uh, by the government. Um, so why can't that conversation be restarted with this uh, current government? Um, but otherwise, um, a, a great piece of work which reflects the times that we are living in. And uh, as a consequence, I'm thrilled to be able to second this motion. Um, there's no other speakers, so um, Councillor Fitzsimon, would you, would you like to do a right of reply? Oh, look, I don't really have much to say except to um, just reiterate the comments that have been made about officers, uh, particularly Michelle Rewai. We did consider an amendment to forbid you from leaving. <laughs> Oh, that it, it didn't have force. Um, yeah, I just uh, I think I think the things that people have raised are um, issues that we will touch on again once we get the report back on the consultation. Thank you. So we're now ready to vote on this on the substantive. So that's carried unanimously. Let's make sure that that's been recorded. Okay, we've now um, come to the end of the meeting. Um, yes, big acknowledgement, thank you. Um, so, etu mo te karakia mutunga. Unu hia, unu hia, unu hia ki te uru tā. Kia mama, ki ngāko, Te tinana, te wairua, i te ara takatū. Koe a rā e rongo, whakaerea ake ki ronga, kia wāte, kia wāte, ai rā kua wāte. And we're having a conversation, e noho, we're just having a conversation this morning with um, Councillor Foon and some of the others about how that, this process is actually really important for us because it's about closing off um, our kōrero for today and after the debates that we've just had it is really important to be able to whakato, to settle, because it is some challenging conversations we have, so it's really important when we do that that people feel very present and, and, and get to acknowledge that. So thank you for that conversation. Oh, yes. And just